Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. To Adolf Hitler in 1940, Britain was no more than an irritant on the periphery of his rapidly expanding Third Reich. He was correct in his assumption that Britain had been almost fatally weakened by the flight from Dunkirk, which had left vast amounts of British armor strewn over the French beaches and countryside. If Britain were to be subdued, there seemed to be no more auspicious time than the summer of 1940. The Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe had proven themselves invincible under well-trained and intelligent commanders. The astonishing rapidity of their European conquests, culminating in France's humiliation, filled them with pride and enthusiasm, whilst in England, a fog of apprehension that swirled around even the political leadership dampened morale and opened rifts between those considering appeasement or resistance. A German invasion seemed not only likely and imminent, but also destined to swamp the inadequate defenses within hours of being launched. The United States offered no assistance other than what could be paid for, and abandoned Britain to the fate America believed was inevitable. Legendary American pilot Charles Lindbergh was not alone in expressing isolationist opinions. Britain would have to withstand German might alone and with the meagre resources it possessed after Dunkirk. In Africa, the Italians were rattling their sabres with some 500,000 troops threatening the thinly defended British colonies and tying up the British Navy in the Mediterranean. Winston Churchill was keenly aware that Britain under attack on two fronts, was teetering on the edge of destruction. He began to prepare the British people for what was to come. On June the 18th, the day after France's capitulation, and just over one month after he became Prime Minister, he memorably defined the coming conflict to the House of Commons. What General Vagan has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. With events in France still fresh in his mind when he spoke those words, Churchill could never have guessed what extraordinary shape the conflict that came to be known as the Battle of Britain would really take. Ironically, Neville Chamberlain, Churchill's predecessor, 
made the foundations for Britain's air defense. He had anticipated the very situation that was soon to arise, and by spending millions on building up the RAF fighter and bomber squadrons and investing in radar technology, made the heroic airborne defense of Britain possible. Had he not done so, Churchill would probably have been Britain's last Prime Minister, and Hitler, strutting with his Third Reich Nazis in London, unstoppable. Hitler viewed Britain with a mixture of contempt for its current weakness and admiration for its past glories and achievements. Surprisingly, perhaps, no invasion plans had been drawn up even as the swastika flew over most of Europe. Indeed, there had been no intention to invade Britain once Europe had collapsed before the weight of the Wehrmacht. Hitler expected that Churchill would quickly abandon his belligerence once France had fallen and sue for peace in the face of the crushing defeat he must surely otherwise suffer. This half-hearted attitude to extending the campaign across the Channel proved self-defeating. But there were genuine reasons for trying to avoid attacking even a badly wounded Britain. The Royal Navy was as great a danger as ever to the German Kriegsmarine around the islands, and the German Naval High Command were extremely worried about what would happen to their destroyers and transport ships during the crossing from France in the face of concerted Royal Navy attacks. In addition, the Germans had no experience of a seaborne invasion on such a scale. They were not trained in landing on beaches. Despite the below-strength British Army, the losses could be enormous. And there was deep uncertainty about another arm of the island defences, the RAF. Franz Halder, German Army Chief of Staff, reflected the reservations of his Führer when he wrote that invasion was to be undertaken only if Britain would accept no other terms of capitulation. In Germany, bathing in the heady enthusiasm of success, there were two men who urged Hitler to take on Britain and end the uncertainty. One was Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, shuddering with anglophobia and repulsive pomposity. The other was Admiral Erich Reder, Commander-in-Chief of the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, keen to get his Navy a role in the series of German victories. He raised the question of invasion twice within a month, and his persistence was eventually rewarded. Despite his keenness for action, his main preference was for a joint naval-air force blockade which would avoid the need for an invasion in the first place. By July the 7th, Hitler had ordered exploratory planning to be carried out for a war against England, as it was known, which, he said confidently, would unleash a storm of wrath and steel. A week later, the idea had rooted, and the armed forces were alerted to be ready for an invasion after the 15th of August. One day later, the invasion had been given a code name, Operation Sea Lion. It was to be a surprise landing in southern England. There was, however, one condition. An invasion was only possible if Luftwaffe air superiority could be established. On July the 19th, Hitler made a peace offer to Churchill during a broadcast speech. It was contemptuously dismissed together with its writer. On both sides of the English Channel, no one doubted that the guns would soon open up once more. No one imagined what extraordinary events were to follow. Over 3,000 sea transports would be required. 50,000 men would be landed within the first hour. 125,000 by the end of the first day. Under the confidence, a nagging doubt remained about an invasion, especially amongst German army commanders. And without anyone realizing, 
Fate had slipped another ace into Churchill's sleeve. Russia. Stalin had been busy absorbing the Baltic states into his own sphere of influence, whilst Germany was greedily swallowing Western Europe. This proved to be good news for Churchill, for Hitler, eager to strike against Russian territories to feed his obsession with Lebensraum, rethought his plans as a consequence of Stalin's actions. A conference on July the 31st revealed that Hitler was now anxious to inflate what had been planned as a limited campaign into a full-scale massive offensive that eventually became Operation Barbarossa. Hitler had not quite taken his eye off the ball in the West, but his focus had changed. Assuming Russia would fall as easily as France, he felt that Britain would then be totally isolated and peace terms readily accepted. An easy victory, a fatal delusion. Hitler now told Admiral Rader that unless the British air and naval forces and their installations could be heavily damaged by air raids, Operation Sea Lion was to be postponed until the following year. Hermann Göring, commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, displaying his usual swaggering confidence, assured Hitler that his air forces could neutralize the naval threat and clear the skies of the RAF. Through overconfidence, the way had been cleared for one of the most momentous struggles in military history. Goering's unfounded assessment was to unexpectedly throttle the Führer's hopes of crushing Britain beneath his violent expansionism. This confident vanity of Goering's, which he projected onto the Luftwaffe with unsustainable boasts as to their capabilities, obscured a fatal lack of judgment. This misjudgment was perhaps understandable at the time, for the Luftwaffe was a formidable enemy. In August 1940, it was assumed on both sides that German aircraft and pilot numbers were superior to those of the British. The German offensive was to be conducted by Air Fleets 2 and 3, under Field Marshals Albert Kesselring, newly promoted after the fall of France, and Hugo Sperler, commander of the Condor Legion that had bombed Spain during the Spanish Civil War. The air fleets contained in total 875 bombers. The mainstay of the bombers were the Heinkel HE-111 and the Dornier 17, both older aircraft, too slow and carrying inadequate armaments. When they reached their targets, their effectiveness was also hampered because they could only carry a 2,000 pound bomb load. They were joined in smaller numbers by the Junkers 88. The air fleets also contained 316 dive bombers, the infamous Junkers 87. Despite their reputation, these proved so vulnerable to the RAF attacks that they had to be withdrawn early on in the battle. The workhorse of the fighter aircraft was the Messerschmitt Bf 109, one of the best fighters made at the time. It was capable of 334 miles per hour, although below 20,000 feet it could be outmaneuvered by both the Spitfire and the Hurricane. Its greatest disadvantage was its range, little more than 100 miles out and back on a tank of fuel. These planes, there were between eight to nine hundred available for the Battle of Britain, were flown by highly skilled crews, mostly trained before the war started, whose average age was 26. In contrast, the average age of the RAF pilots was 20. Many had been in the service for just 10 months, and at the height of the battle, had less than 20 hours flying experience. The two most famous of their planes 
bore names that would be spoken of with admiration and pride long after the Third Reich had been reduced to no more than a vile memory. Although there were a number of other planes available, the backbone of fighter command aircraft were the Supermarine Spitfire and the Hawker Hurricane. They were the best all-round fighters of their day and could outmaneuver the Messerschmitts, especially at lower altitudes. Goering is recorded as saying to Hitler that to win the battle he would like a squadron of Spitfires and it is the Spitfire that has come to symbolize the Battle of Britain even though it made up just 31 percent of operational fighter planes when the battle began. The men who flew these planes came not only from Britain but from Ireland, Poland, Canada and indeed all over the world. Unlike the combined air fleets of the Luftwaffe, the RAF used separate commands for the fighters, the bombers, and the patrols over the coastal areas of Britain and enemy-occupied areas. Commander-in-chief of Fighter Command, in charge of these precious young lives, and who was pitched into a war of nerves against his German opposite Göring, was Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding. Controversially, he had warned of the danger to Britain if the RAF were thrown into full-scale battle against the Germans during the campaign in France and had held back the bulk of his forces. In view of the losses sustained in France, he was wise to do so. Of Dowding's four operational air groups, only two were available to defend the south of England from attack. 11 Group, under Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, and 12 Group, north of London, under Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory. By August, the RAF could call on some 1,300 operational fighter planes, compared to about 869 fighters and 875 bombers for the Luftwaffe. Although the RAF was seriously disadvantaged, and that its aircraft were stretched to cover the entire British Isles. Moreover, their achievement seems all the more incredible, as their task contained a double jeopardy, for they had to try to down the German bombers whilst simultaneously fending off and chasing the Messerschmitts. On the 10th, some 70 planes appeared over the skies of the docks in Cardiff and as their payloads of bombs screamed down, the Battle of Britain had begun in earnest. The docks at Portsmouth and Southampton were also targeted and suffered severely under the German attacks. Churchill went to see the damage for himself and was moved to comment that their houses may be low, but their hearts are high. British shipping came under increased German attention as the Luftwaffe tried to tempt the RAF fighters out to meet them. In vain, for Dowding, with invasion fears still circulating in his mind, decided not to risk his pilots' lives at this early stage, leaving many convoys to the mercy of the bombers. Admiral Raider and his Kriegsmarine were engaged in blockading Britain and fought bitter battles with the Royal Navy in their struggle to keep shipping lanes open and supplies flowing. The British Navy was also laboring under a double burden, for the fleet in the Mediterranean was now engaged in ferocious fighting for supremacy against the Italians. It was vital that routes to Britain's African bases remained open as the threat posed by Mussolini's forces increased. Continuous waves of bombers and fighters were to sweep in over England, penetrating ever deeper, an unstoppable blanket of destruction. The date was set for August the 10th and codenamed Adlertag, Eagle Day. 
On the day of his greatest hopes, Göring was frustrated once again, this time by bad weather, and the grand attack had to be postponed. Next day the weather was no better, but uncoordinated Luftwaffe attacks went ahead. On the 13th, with heavy cloud cover, several formations were already airborne when the attack was postponed yet again. Those in the air were left to fend as best they could with no precise orders. These initial battles were no less ferocious than the major engagements still to come. The Luftwaffe were targeting RAF airfields, but often the wrong ones. For only 32 of 53 sorties between August the 12th and September the 6th were flown against fighter command airfields. A major blunder. A secondary target for the Luftwaffe were the radar installations. But their failure to concentrate on the eradication of these vital stations was another serious miscalculation. There were only six large-scale raids on the stations along the south coast, practically all of which took place on the 12th of August. Thereafter, raids were spasmodic. Yet without radar, the Battle of Britain might have ended abruptly with the invasion of Britain. The Germans underestimated its importance. Radar stood for radio detection and ranging and had been developed in 1935. Although their range of detection was only 80 miles and ineffective inland at the time of the Battle of Britain, it was sufficient to seek out the German aircraft flying in from France. Neither could it detect planes below 1,000 feet until a second system was introduced to compensate for this deficiency. By 1939, Britain was circled with radar installations. But pilots were still only given four-minute warnings of enemy attack. The Luftwaffe could be over the channel in six minutes. Those vital minutes made the difference between effective defense and entire squadrons being annihilated on the ground. The Germans assumed, wrongly, that the all-important operations rooms for the radar would be deep underground. Another reason why they did not pursue intense bombing of the stations. In fact, personnel were working in the huts below the aerial towers. As the fighting thundered over them, the teams worked on, plotting the enemy aircraft locations and relaying them to the group commanders so that the defense was not caught out. On August the 15th, the air over Britain was filled with bombers and the Luftwaffe gave a foretaste of the intensive violence that was to become commonplace for the next two months. The Luftwaffe swept in over the southern coast and for the first and last time, Air Fleet 5 bombers with fighter escorts from Norway and Denmark flew in with two formations over the North Sea to attack Yorkshire and Newcastle. This proved a costly mistake, for the first formation lost 15 planes, whereas the RAF lost none. Ten of the 50 bombers from the second formation were shot down. After that battering, Air Fleet 5 was withdrawn from combat over England. In the south, there were a greater number of raids, fortunately not adequately coordinated, that kept the RAF constantly chasing about the airspace. And it was not until early evening that a major formation with 200 aircraft was spotted on the radar. The warning was effective, for the RAF rose to meet them with some 170 fighters. And, as with another heavy raid shortly after, were able to disperse them with little effective damage caused on the ground. 500 bombers were deployed in total that day in over 1,700 missions. The infamous Junkers 87, the Stuka dive bomber, 
so effective in helping to conquer mainland Europe, proved to be totally inadequate against the RAF and was withdrawn in view of the high casualty rates. Another problem proved to be the necessity of providing constant close fighter escorts for the bombers, for this handicapped a great many of the German fighter pilots in their choice of actions. As the day closed, 75 German planes had been lost. The RAF was able to compensate for fighter plane losses. By September, 1,900 fighters had been produced, as opposed to just 775 Messerschmitt 109s. The lack of experienced pilots was more worrying. Losses were running at not much short of one quarter of operational strength in August, more than the 320 pilots per month that the operational training units could turn out. The result was that inexperienced pilots were plunged into life and death combat with German fighter pilots who had enjoyed the privilege of a far longer and more rigorous training. Seen in this light, the bravery of the RAF pilots was all the more uplifting. Churchill knew this as well as anyone. On the 20th, he delivered one of the most famous and powerful of all wartime speeches that included a phrase destined to fill British hearts with pride and defiance. Or over the seas which surround it are either destroyed or captured. Whereas a considerable proportion of our machines and also of our pilots are saved and soon again, in many cases, come into action. The gratitude of every home in our island in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen, who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Churchill had not aimed these lines directly at fighter command for their unstinting sacrifice. It was a grateful nation that later lay the words humbly at the feet of the men who so deserved them in those desperate days. Britain needed reassurance and strong leadership, for on the 24th, the thunder of Luftwaffe squadrons and falling bombs were once again filling the air. Liverpool was bombed on four successive nights as the Luftwaffe sent over planes in ever-increasing numbers. To avoid the radar, they flew in low over the water to join attack formations once over the land. The German bombers were now being escorted with three times the number of fighters, a testimony to the effectiveness of the RAF. The escort role accorded to the Messerschmitts was a hindrance to the scope of their activity. But the RAF began to suffer increased losses until they almost equaled those of the Luftwaffe, losing 39 fighters on August the 31st for the Germans' loss of 45. The RAF could not support this rate of attrition in men and aircraft for long if the intensity of the raids continued. The bombing was having a terrible effect on the airfields and communications, with maintenance teams occupied in a constant, desperate struggle to keep the situation on the ground as beneficial as possible, to support their pilots fighting for their lives and Britain's welfare in the skies overhead. Despite the heroic efforts, Britain was at crisis point. Dowding could not know that the Germans were wildly overestimating the RAF losses, 
and could no more understand the ferocity of the British defence than the reason why so many planes came out to engage them when Britain was almost on its knees. German intelligence was suggesting that 50% of the fighter force had been destroyed since August the 8th, as opposed to just 12% of the Luftwaffe. The truth was stunning. RAF losses accounted for less than 450 planes by the beginning of September, whereas the Luftwaffe had lost a total of some 900 planes by the end of August. An extraordinary feat of skilled flying by the RAF. After the war, Adolf Gallant, a German fighter commander, recalled the demoralization of the Luftwaffe pilots. As day after day their attacks seemed to bring them no closer to success, and the strength of the defense never weakened. German pilots were becoming as exhausted as the British. On both sides, the pilots returned from sorties without their comrades. For the RAF pilots came the added horror of being machine-gunned once they had bailed out of stricken machines. From the Germans' point of view, the order to fire in such situations was necessary. If the pilots were rescued, they would soon be airborne again and ready to fight until the last breath. The strain was unbearable. When friends failed to return, there was hardly time to mourn. Sleep overcame them to distract the thought that tomorrow might be the last time they would clamber into the cockpit of the Spitfire or the Messerschmitt. In the midst of this wealth of tragedy, a change occurred that no one realized was to lance the poisonous venom Hitler's vile mind was pouring out over an innocent nation. In late August, the Luftwaffe had increased its attention on ground targets closer to London. Pursued by an RAF fighter, one bomber crew jettisoned its payload. By a twist of fate, it was flying over London. Despite the fact that there was only a small amount of localized damage, Churchill was incensed. He could not know that the bombing was unintentional and his reaction caused the battle to change its shape. Indefinably, the scales began to tip in favor of the RAF. London, indeed Britain as a whole, had already been suffering from bombing raids. Churchill felt it was time to strike back, so he ordered that Bomber Command hit the center of Hitler's domain with the bombing of Berlin. On the night of August the 25th to the 26th, Bomber Command sent some 80 bombers to carry out Churchill's wishes and strike at the German capital. Bomber Command crews suffered appalling losses in raids over Germany, just as the Fighter Command crews did over England. In bitterly cold cockpits with pilots untrained for night flying, their missions were almost guaranteed to end in a meeting with death. More raids followed as Churchill ignored Hitler's enraged warnings and the first signs of a weakness that would plague the Führer's future war plans came to light. His emotions ran away with him. Up until the bombing of Berlin, Hitler had lost confidence in the Luftwaffe being able to break British resistance and had not reckoned with its collapse that year. Now he desired nothing more. Armed with false information on the imminent demise of fighter command, he ordered that the main thrust of Luftwaffe bombing should be concentrated on London and the industrial complexes of other major cities. Goering set the starting date for the renewed strategy for September the 7th. Although both the British and German bomber crews had instructions to target only industrial and military installations in urban areas, the inability to carry out precision bombing made it inevitable that civilians would suffer immensely. For London, as August passed into September, the third phase of the battle was launched and the Blitz was about to unfold in all its terrifying horror. On September the 7th, 
350 Luftwaffe bombers rose into the afternoon sky over France. Their goal was London. Accompanied by almost 650 fighters, Göring watched them pass with admiring satisfaction. Flying at higher than usual altitudes, with fighters flying ahead and beside the bombers, three waves hit London's docklands and the East End. This unexpected change in targets and tactics caused the RAF to arrive late, although it once again proved its mettle by downing 41 aircraft for the loss of 28. Radar was unable to accurately estimate high altitudes, and the closeness of frontline RAF airfields to the targets meant that planes were unable to gain enough height fast enough to be completely effective on initial contact with enemy squadrons. This first mass attack killed 300 people and seriously injured more than 1,300. Fires raged among the rubble and served as guiding beacons for the subsequent night raid. Firemen, regardless of the risk to their own lives as the bombs fell around them, fought to contain the infernos and rescue those trapped beneath the smashed buildings. From 8 p.m. until almost 5 a.m., Bombs tore down into the capital, causing Göring to triumphantly gloat to his wife. Victory was almost tangible, he thought. He could not have been further from the truth. The night bombing presented a new problem, for a lack of RAF night fighters meant that the defense of the capital fell to the anti-aircraft guns. On the 7th, only 264 guns were available, and their effectiveness was extremely limited. The intensity of the bombing resuscitated a fear that had almost been forgotten about. The reason aerial attacks were taking place at all, invasion. To the British Chiefs of Staff, the bombing of the 7th, together with reconnaissance photography and Enigma decryption, showing an increased concentration of German forces and barges on the French coast, were an indication that the invasion was likely to take place soon. The code word Cromwell was issued. Church bells rang out. Invasion estimated to be within 12 hours. It was a frightening prospect, for fighter command was at full stretch. It could not possibly cope with an invasion force too. But as night fell, it was clear that Britain was to be spared ground-based terror for at least a few more hours. On the 9th, Kesselring launched another massive daylight raid on London, the biggest yet undertaken. Only this time, the RAF was prepared for it. Squadrons from three fighter groups intercepted the raids with such force that the majority of German formations broke apart and only half reached the target area. The limited bombing that followed proved ineffective as most of the targets were not hit. It was an important moment in the battle. Hitler, still wary of Britain and the water, was less than happy with the outcome. Discouraged, he postponed his invasion plans until the 24th of September. Fortunately, Hitler had misjudged his advantage. Although the lack of effective fighter defense against the first night raid had led the Germans to believe that fighter command was coming close to the end of its capabilities, the invasion never came. During the next week, the bombers and their escorts flew repeated raids over London, the most intense taking place on the 15th. The RAF fighters again caused such damage to the German air fleets that almost a quarter of Luftwaffe bombers were put out of action, with damage to many others. As before, it was the densely populated East End that took the brunt of the bombing raid. By the 17th, Hitler, together with the majority of naval staff and many in the Luftwaffe, reluctantly had to accept that the claims still emanating from Göring, predicting the end of the RAF in five days, were hollow boasts. The RAF showed no signs of defeat whatsoever. 
Hitler postponed the invasion until further notice, and the following day allowed for the dispersal of the transport barges and other shipping gathered along the channel ports, where repeated bomber command raids had also shown that the RAF was hardly a spent force. After a series of further false alerts, by the end of October, the British estimated that the threat had diminished almost entirely. They were right. On October the 12th, Sea Lion was postponed until the spring of 1941. In January of that year, all preparation for Sea Lion was halted. For Hitler had a greater campaign than he needed to fight. In Russia. It was in mid-September, as Luftwaffe strategy was changing to heavy bombing over British cities, that Hitler was told of anti-German sentiments circulating within the Red Army. Hitler was alert to possible Russian invasion, and these rumors confirmed his suspicions. He had not been able to understand why the British could not accept the hopelessness of their predicament and sue for peace. He had come to believe that Churchill was counting on Russian intervention, and his acute fears and unfulfilled dreams brought him to the conclusion that he must carry out a preemptive offensive. Britain was of secondary importance and could be dealt with later. There was no doubt in his mind that Britain would be in his hands sooner or later. Long before Sea Lion was finally halted, General Paulus, controversial commander of the troops trapped later at Stalingrad, had been appointed to sketch out plans for an offensive against Russia. The focus of Hitler's attentions was beginning to shift from Britain to the greater menace in the East. The cruel misery that was to engulf Russia was to help dilute the Führer's attention on Britain. The change proved crucial. As September wore on, Goering continued sending over daylight raids, despite the fact that Apart from occasional successes when aircraft factories were temporarily put out of action, these were proving ever less successful in terms of winning the conflict. In desperation, the end of the month saw two large-scale attempts to create the havoc he so desired. As the RAF raced into the skies to meet the air fleets, they could not know that their determination meant that these were to be the last massed daytime raids of the battle. Fighter Command pilots with their Spitfires and Hurricanes once more flew into the lethal dogfights with the Messerschmitts and caused the failure of a raid on the 27th, whilst preventing most of the bombers from reaching London on the 30th. The losses were simply too great for the Luftwaffe. Massed daylight raids were abandoned. It was an unspoken admittance of failure to crush Fighter Command by the Germans. Nonetheless, from now on, night bombing was to test the determination of Britain's resistance to the utmost. Daylight attacks still existed in the form of fighter-bomber raids intended to wear down the remains of the fighter command force in the still erroneous belief, which Goering even now could not clear from his head, that it was near collapse with less than 200 fighters operational. This switch in tactics, making good use of the Messerschmitt 109 at high altitudes, began to take effect temporarily, and the loss rates for the RAF crept steadily upwards. Fighter Command was quick to change its tactics to meet this new threat. Although not designed for high altitude flying, Spitfire patrols were now constantly in the air at greater heights to counteract the effect of surprise attack and were joined by other squadrons once the enemy had been sighted. Once their attentions were not diverted by the need to stop daytime bombers as well as beat off the fighters, the operational losses for the RAF began to decline from their peaks in August and September. Historians would later place the end of the Battle of Britain on the 31st of October 1940, although it was more of a petering out in fighter activity, a shift in emphasis, rather than a decisive end point.
But vitally, Britain was still undefeated. With the absence now of any real sense of purpose in attacking Britain, bombing the population into exhaustion seemed to be as good a tactic as any other. The Battle of Britain and the Blitz caused the deaths of over 40,000 people. London was bombed every night for 57 nights. In November, Göring switched Luftwaffe concentration solely onto night bombing, gleeful at the thought that he would soon be able to tell Hitler that Britain had been bombed into submission and subservience. The terrible onslaught began on the 14th. Three days later, Hitler ordered a total naval blockade to operate against the British Isles. Countless lives were lost because of this order. Yet the battle at sea was destined to fail as surely as had the battle in the skies. The nighttime bombings brought recrimination down upon Dowding's head for not doing enough to prevent them, and he was replaced in November. One of the most undeserved humiliations handed out to an officer during the war. Goering went on boasting and wasting the lives of his Luftwaffe crews throughout the war, eventually escaping the hangman by poisoning himself. The tragedy and heroism of millions of victims of war that followed in the years to 1945 are not diminished by the light that shines on the selfless deeds of the RAF Fighter Command and Bomber Command pilots. The RAF were in a position to achieve a miracle at a turning point in Britain's history, and each pilot ensured that the miracle was kept alive until his plane was shot into flames. It is impossible to find words to describe adequately what these men achieved, supported by the dedicated teams below them, as they soared to almost certain deaths in the skies above Britain during the long summer and autumn of 1940. The young pilots were undoubtedly brave, undoubtedly skilled and determined as they faced German pilots of equal courage and expertise. No one knew at the time that the waste of young life was just beginning, knew of unparalleled destruction of millions of lives still to come, or of the incredible impact the tragedy being played out in the skies over Britain in the early days of the war would have. British fighter aces would have to wait until years later to be credited the honor that their abilities in battle justified. Their sacrifice meant nothing less than the freedom of Britain, Europe, and the rest of a conflict-torn world. It was the first failure of Hitler's evil system that eventually led to the demise of one of the most vile dictatorships ever known to man. To the men of the RAF Fighter Command is owed by countries all over the world gratitude that can never be repaid, admiration that was never more greatly deserved. <laughs>